Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our webcast. Today's topic is Lean Analytics for Non-Tech Companies. I'm Melissa Tinetegan, Executive Producer of the Lean Startup Conference, happening December 9th to 11. Visit leanstartup.co for more information. Our speakers today are Alistair Kroll and Ben Yoskovitz. Alistair is an analyst, entrepreneur, and startup accelerator. He's founded several companies, including CoRadiant and NetworkShop. Lean Analytics is his fourth book on technology and entrepreneurship. He blogs about too many things at solveforinteresting.com. Ben is VP of product at Go Instant, which was acquired by Salesforce. He's also a partner at Year One Labs and ex-CEO slash founder at Standout Jobs. He blogs at instigatorblog.com. Take it away, guys. Hi, everyone. So, uh... Yeah, Ben and I have spent a lot of time since Lean Analytics came out talking to big companies. And normally the stereotype of uh, Lean Analytics is companies that are, or Lean Startup is companies that are smaller and uh, tech-centric. And so we've purposely sort of been preparing for the upcoming event in December. I've uh, been talking to companies uh, that don't fit that bill. So for me, I've been talking to, I talked to a 9.8 billion euro a year tissue paper maker a couple of weeks ago. Um, DHL, big logistics company. How about you, Ben? You've been talking a few, right? I have, yeah. And again, focusing on the event in December, which is really about intrapreneurs, although that will be the core focus for today, uh, a lot of surprisingly interesting things going on within large companies. So it's been pretty amazing to, to talk to folks about the stuff that they're doing. They may not call it lean, lean startup or lean analytics, uh, but they're doing really innovative things internally to do experimentation and fail quickly and try things out. Um, so it's been exciting. So uh, what is it? I mean, we see a lot of uh, people say, oh, you can't be lean if you're a big company. Do you still believe that? Um, no, I think that what I'm seeing at lean inside large companies is that um, groups within that company are able to do it. And, and I think the most interesting thing I've discovered is that they just do it and sort of it becomes the de facto way that they're doing things, right? They don't wait for every, you know, policies to change within the company. They don't wait for big decisions to be made. They just say, hey, you know, before we go on this, embark on this huge project, why don't we just go talk to our customers first? And then everybody just sort of says, oh, I guess that's the way we do things. And they just start to follow along with that. So I'm seeing pockets of activity, pockets of lean activity inside of large companies, even though, you know, shifting a whole company's strategy or way of doing things is much, is much harder to do. Sure. Um, and I think uh, what we've been digging into, it's hard to get people to give you the metrics because, you know, big companies, especially large public companies, are driven by stuff like accounting needs or SEC filings. And so they have these very specific metrics around uh, acid test ratios or balance sheets and income statements and so on that guide a lot of the metrics they, they, they optimize for, right? Yeah, no question. I mean, getting getting to the numbers is tricky. It's the piece I think that's still missing for a lot of companies. So they're applying some more, you know, lean and or more agile strategies um, towards building products or or, or marketing, or, you know, marketing experiments or initiatives or whatever they're doing. The data and getting them convinced around really looking at data and simplifying that data is is something that I'm seeing as still being a challenge. Where you know they're, they 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 sort of collect tons and tons of stuff and they want to stick to that, or they're collecting stuff that maybe isn't terribly actionable, but they're still like, well, that's just the way we do things. So that, I think, is still the piece that needs to shift for a lot of these companies, is focusing on simpler metrics, focusing on actionable metrics, uh, before they can really apply lean principles very effectively. Sure. So uh, we're here on Ustream. This is supposed to be as interactive as possible. If you guys want to yell at us, either on Ustream or on Twitter, um, you know, hopefully we'll see that, and uh, we're going to field those questions and try and uh, handle as many of them as we can. And uh, but we do have lots of stuff as usual that we want to talk about. So um, I guess I'd like to talk about friction a little bit. Um, one of the things that that really differentiates. So we started out by saying this event is for non-tech companies. There's this myth, and I think part of it came from Paul Graham that that Lean only works for tech companies. And his view was that uh, if you're a business in search of a uh, business model. Um, the rate of growth, either in customer engagement or revenue, that you need to see, in his mind, is between 5 and 10% a week. 5 or 10% a week um, is what he believes qualifies as a startup. So 5 to 10% a week growth in, in users or uh, in revenues if you're post-revenue. 
And if that's the threshold that you're living by, then um, the only things that can usually scale at that rate for a long period of time are based on technology because you don't have to, you know, add uh, flesh-based APIs, what some people refer to as humans. Um, you don't have to add that to your, your system, right? It's much more, much more efficient. And so when we say this event is for, is for lean startup for non-tech companies, that seems a little weird, but I think the reality is that everybody is a tech company these days. And we'll talk about some examples of that, that, that to say I'm a non-tech company is kind of delusional. So what seems to me different about the non-tech companies is if you take the traditional uh, lean startup cycle of, of build, measure, learn, uh, first of all, building stuff is really hard if you're not digital. Um, it's really easy for me to uh, present three web pages to people and have them and see which one works best or try different prices with people. It's much more awkward if I give different people in my restaurant a different price for their meals at the table to see how they feel. You know, it's much harder to run side-by-side -side classified ads for the same thing. Uh, and word kind of leaks out. So the atoms, uh, as opposed to bits, of a non-tech company mean you often resort to broadcast communications, right? One-to-many, like publishing, as opposed to the one-to-one -one communications you can have uh, in technology. It's hard to put up several signs in a Walmart uh, because everyone's going to see them, whereas you can put up a different sign, essentially, for each customer online. And so one of the kinds of friction that I think non-tech companies really struggle with is how do I get to do testing um, and how do I build several alternatives and experiments when I am constrained by atoms instead of bits? Uh, I guess the second one that, that really strikes me and when I talk to people that they struggle with is um, if you're dealing with atoms, uh, the second part of that cycle, the measure part of the cycle, uh, tracking and measuring users is much harder. It's why people spend so much money with, uh, with loyalty cards. It's why people are... Uh, using technology like um, uh, the uh, phone, cell phone tracking stuff to see who's been in their stores. It's desperate. Uh, those companies are desperate for some amount of tracking because humans are terrible at recording their actions. Anybody who's ever run a punch clock or, uh, or a fast food joint knows that. Uh, software has no choice but to record its actions. So we just say, let's go analyze stuff. That's really easy, right? Um, and I think the third in the, in the learn phase of the build, measure, learn cycle, uh, the problem with many larger non-tech companies is they already, if you're small and you're running a bakery, you know the business model, right? Sell baked goods for less money than it costs. If you are big, then you're probably in, you're probably structured to perpetuate an existing business model. So those three things in the build, measure, learn cycle are very different for non-tech companies because it's harder to, to build many things to try them out. Um, it's harder to record what actually happened. And culturally, it's harder to learn from them. So I, I, it's those three uh, that I've been interested in seeing how people overcome as I, as I talk to companies. Right, and I think, Alistair, I think what would be interesting um, is, in my mind, the way I look at this, I, 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 I completely agree with that, and I think the challenge for non-tech companies, uh, therefore, is to be much more creative with the kinds of um, experimentation and let's call it the building that they actually do, right? So I think, and we have some examples of that that um, Alistair will share um, today, but I think that's really the challenge. In in software world, it's pretty obvious, like, you know, let's build this feature, give it to half of our users, right? Um, it's pretty, you know, the experiments, let's A-B test a web page for messaging. These things get pretty straightforward, and uh, non-tech companies will also use this stuff to draw people into their, into their companies, into their businesses, but I think it's about the creativity that's required, the extra thinking that's required around what do I test and how do I test it. And so, you know, we have some examples, I think, restaurant-specific uh, ones that we can jump into now or share later, Alistair, but I think that's, that's the challenge for non-tech companies. How do I come up with the experiments that make sense? If I can come up with those, the measuring becomes easier, the learning by extension becomes easier, and it's really what are the experiments I actually should be running. Sure. So that's a good point. Let's, let's talk about restaurants for a while because I think there's a uh, – I like to pick on the restaurant industry because everyone knows what a restaurant does, and there's still a lot of innovation to be done. Uh, we talk about in the, in the book uh, what it would be like as a restaurateur to go through the stages of Lean Startup. Uh, we, we believe that any company goes through five distinct stages of growth and that they have a different set of metrics that they want to uh, look at in those stages. So, for example, in the empathy stage early on, as a restaurateur, you're very focused on things like 
um, what do people want to eat, uh, what foods are going to sell the best, uh, you know, what's going to get diners in the door. That's a very different set of things from later on when you're trying to focus on loyalty. So in the empathy stage, uh, the owner is probably learning about diners in her area. She's figuring out what foods are available, what trends are, are out there and eating, what the cost of certain things are. And so the metrics are going to be things like what's popular um, or, you know, what questions keep coming up, uh, what patterns people uh, used to show in a particular neighborhood and what are they like now. Um, and I think the best example of that is like the food truck. To me, a food truck is like the ultimate lean restaurant because uh, you can change your locations and you can change your revenue pretty easily. And um, I think though that combination is, um, uh, I think that uh, combination was a very good thing for uh, early stage restaurants. But the metrics you're looking at there are like, how many different corners have I tried it on? How many days have I gone out and talked to people? Where did I get the most, of the least attention? Uh, where were the other, and you know, where were the, you can go and see where the other food trucks are parked and try out places near them and see which ones you compete best with. Uh, later on, you're going to worry about things like, you know, what's my menu and what makes people keep coming back. Um, and, you know, you've, you've opened a restaurant. I think the, the stickiness phase, I see a lot of people who, when they open a restaurant, go out and you know, they laminate their, their menu and they spend a lot of time working on it. The reality is your menu is going to change a lot. And if it doesn't, if you're not printing your menu out, then you're probably not experimenting enough. And you've got to have metrics there for things like loyalties, recommendations, referrals, endorsements, uh, but also how much your inventory is turning over. So very different um, uh, metrics from later on when you're looking at revenue per cover or uh, ratings on Yelp and so on when you get later in the process. Um, so one of the things that we think uh, that it's important for any business to look at, uh, two things actually. One is they got to be able to draw lines in the sand. you got to be able to say this is the um, this is what we think is a good goal or a good threshold, and this is what bad looks like. Uh, and the second is the leading indicator. Is there something now that you can find about your business that tells you about the business later? Uh, a good example of line in the sand. So a friend of ours runs a restaurant called Solare in San Diego. It's an Italian restaurant. And uh, he's he used to be the general manager of Teradata. So he's pretty data-driven compared to the average restaurant entrepreneur. Uh, and he, I, I was at his restaurant one night, and he said, you know, uh, his son said, hey, Dad, 24. And, and Randy said, oh, great. Of course, me being an analytics nerd, I said, what does that mean? He says, well, the ratio of labor costs to gross revenue is something we track a lot. Uh, if you are spending more than 30% of your uh, gross revenue on labor costs, you've probably overstaffed. If you're below 20%, you're probably understaffed and you're making people miserable. So 24% is just about right. It's a pretty good sweet spot. And that's a good line in the sand for him. He can sort of have that metric and understand that because he's at the revenue stage of building the business. He's already moved past sort of virality. He's got the menu set up. Uh, the leading indicator that Randy looks at uh, is uh, the number of reservations he has by 5 p.m. Because if he has data on how many reservations he's got at 5 p.m., he knows from experience he's going to get roughly 250. If he has 50 reservations at 5 p.m., he'll get roughly 250 covers that night. So um, you're going to get some ratio that shows you, to, I, I know now at 5 p.m. how many people are going to be in my restaurant that night. And that's really good because I can tell some staff not to come in if I'm a little light or I can order more food if I'm doing well. Um, and uh, the obviously this number varies significantly uh, by the restaurant. Uh, so McDonald's, for example, is uh, very different from um, the fat duck, uh, obviously in terms of that ratio. But once you know that ratio for your restaurant, uh, you have a very good leading indicator of what's going to happen. So just thinking in terms of metrics, what are my lines in the sand for the business I'm at? Uh, what leading indicators now give me something I can use to change the business later? That's that's very much thinking analytically. And I think a lot of people, they don't interpret analytics as that. But that's just sort of scientific thinking about the business and the metrics that matter. I think one of the challenges that restaurants or anybody has is uh, learning about the culture of experimentation. This is a really big issue, right? Experimentation, I see my videos jumping around, so hopefully you guys can hear my voice okay. Um, experimentation is a real challenge, and, and I'll give you a good example. I was, I was in a, um, an airport restaurant a few weeks ago, and I paid for my bill, or I got the check, and the waitress had written in purple ink on it, you know, thanks, a little, uh, her name, a little heart over it, whatever. And I thought to myself, does purple ink make me tip more? Uh, because I'm kind of a dork for things like that. And so, Maybe green ink would make me tip more. But the real question is, as a person in that, let's say you're an employee, you're, you're interested in optimizing revenues, 
how would the company set up an environment where you could even try that kind of thing? How would you even go about um, setting up a system for employees to run experiments? Because it's a hard problem, right? Uh, you need a control group and a regular group. And it turns out that there's a lot of this data. I mean, uh, restaurants all have open table. Uh, we actually asked Randy for a chunk of his open table data. And you can see sort of where all the things came from, what the total, uh, the, the revenue per table were, and so on. So you've got a lot of these things that you could uh, experiment with. You could try giving different tables different menus and seeing if they ordered differently. Like, why does, an, why does a restaurant owner print one kind of menu instead of handing out three menus? Asking, you know, give the same menu to each table, obviously, but handing out three menus and asking the um, uh, the uh, uh, wait staff to enter which menu they got, and then looking at the end and saying, "Hey, it turns out this menu layout is the most effective for sales." Seems like a pretty easy thing to do, right? But culturally, we're not thinking like that. We're not sort of we don't get up in the morning and go, "How do I experiment with the world around me?" And I think that's the biggest challenge for not just tech companies, but non-tech companies. I think a startup is more aware of its uncertainty, and so it doesn't recognize the need for experimentation. But big companies have to be much more aware of the fact that they need to be always experimenting and the fact that they need to create systems for experimentation out at the end. There's a, there's a, a line uh, from networking, the network knows more about the world than the nodes. And I think you need to sort of push that out to the edge to let the innovation scale. Um, and I, I, this, this is, I realize now as we're talking about this, this starts, sounds like lean analytics for restaurants, but it's not, it's just, we like food. Um, but, um, this makes me think, Alistair, uh, experimentation, two things. One is the example about the airport, which I think you can do, but I think it's a culture of experimentation and also a culture of, um, a, a acknowledging that failure is going to happen. Right. right. And, um, that's, that's, that's very common with all companies, uh, non-tech and tech, where um, one of the reasons why we don't experiment is because we're scared of the answer. And right. so you have to realize um, in any business that you're in that there's, if, you, if you're running, you keep the experiments small, you keep them contained, um, and you, you acknowledge the fact that, yes, we may fail, and my employees may fail, and this experiment may not work. Um, and if you can get to that point culturally as a company, big or small, um, then all of the employees will start to rally around this idea. Um, and then the idea of the one metric that matters, I think, really helps there because you can say, here's the one number we care about this week, this month, whatever it is, because we're trying to solve a problem, we're trying to increase revenue, or we're trying to increase our margins, or we're trying to get more exposure for our brand so more people walk into our retail store. Whatever it is that you're trying to do, if you can rally everybody around that and a single number to simplify, and then realize that you know, five employees are all going to try five different things and some will work and some won't, you can really start to cycle through things and, and make very quick progress. Um, and, and so I think, Alistair, I think the, the example with the airport, I think, is a, is a good one um, related sure, to this sure. in terms of, you know, effort versus thinking outside. I mean, I'll use outside the box, but like thinking in a way um, differently Subversive, about our business. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, the example Ben's referring to, and, and we didn't actually include this in the book, but we love it. Um, was there's a in, in Houston they had a problem with uh, baggage delivery, and the problem with baggage delivery is the bags simply took a long time to come out. And so when they'd survey people about their experience in this airport, the number one complaint was the bags take too long to come out. So having looked at this, they spent a year retooling the baggage supply chain system, uh, and they got the time it took the bags to get from the plane to the carousel from an average of nine minutes to an average of six minutes, which is really good, right? They worked super hard, they did a great job. Um, and then they did a survey and said, what's the biggest problem with baggage? And guess what? The biggest problem was um, the biggest problem was that bags take too long to come out. So they went and cried themselves a little bit, uh, cried themselves to sleep a little because they just spent a lot of taxpayer money fixing things. And then some enterprising civil servant said, hey, um, what if we asked the planes to park a little farther from the carousels? So for a month, they had the planes park further away and complaints went to zero. Uh, this is a great example of subversive thinking because as an entrepreneur in any business, you have you have an abundance of possible things you could be tracking. Uh, you have an abundance of experiments you could run. Of those experiments, very few actually do what you want. Um, and so uh, I think what's going on is that you have this amazing number of possible things that you could do, and you need to look at the different experiments you could run and reduce them dramatically to... Uh, the, to weigh them in terms of not just how beneficial they'll be, but how much effort it takes to actually carry them out. 
Um, so, Alistair, we have a question. I, I wanted to just jump in with it here. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm been thinking about it as you were talking. Um, do we have an example we can share of deploying lean analytics in the case of a telecom firm or a service provider? Uh, so I think lean analytics and service providers, there's certainly, because service providers are so concerned with recurring revenue, typically a telecom and service provider, you're dealing with things like churn. Uh, there are two. One is um, knowing the, so service providers actually know this very well. Anything that software as a service companies can be applied, uh, used can be applied to telecoms. And so when we've talked to uh, software as a service companies, uh, they have traditionally used similar metrics for churn. So they do things like tracking um, how often someone is, um, how, how often someone uh, sticks around, how long they stick around, um, and then how much it costs to acquire them. So any metrics around customer acquisition cost and customer lifetime value are obviously right at the core of a telecom business. Uh, where we do see people using stuff for service providers is looking at uh, churn anticipation. So there's a leading indicator of behavior today that suggests someone won't renew at the end of their um, cycle. And so trying to find out what attributes of someone's behavior today are highly correlated with their likelihood of leaving. And then heading that off by changing that behavior is a big one. Um, I'll give you a, a great example that um, is somewhat related, but I think shows why it's not enough to take these numbers at face value. We talked to Jana Eggers, who uh, helped set up the Innovation Lab at Intuit and um, was also at Spreadshirt and most recently at Blackboard. And she told us that um, when they were at Spreadshirt, they would do the net promoter score. Uh, which was a measurement of satisfaction. Basically, would you tell other people about this product or service? And they track it by country and by region. And one day they saw that Norway just fell off the map. It just the, the net promoter score for Norway was terrible. Most companies would go, oh, I guess the Norwegians don't like t-shirts this week and kind of leave it at that. And I think Jenna's whole thing was, we're really going to chase this down and try and find out um, what the story is. So they got on the phone and they called uh, well, the Norwegian customs office. And they found out that Norway the week before had consolidated all of its post offices into all of its uh, customs used to happen at the regional post office. Now it happens centrally. And as a result of that, um, the, all of the, tra all of the uh, customs package uh, processing was taking far longer and so support had gone down. And by contacting customs in Norway, they were able to work out how to label things to actually make things get delivered faster. So one of the problems are uh, one of the problems that a lot of people we talk to uh, mention is people are data obsessed, but they're not sort of chasing the data. They look at the data as a way, especially in a big company, of covering their butts. Well, you know, we were tracking that data, so that's it's more of a cover your ass methodology. And the reality is, you need to use that as a way to uh, chase that data. And I think telecom providers do a horrible job of this, and service providers, any big service for a bank, a telecom, there's these frequent indicators that things are going uh, pear shaped. Uh, but very seldom do they follow up on that and try and find out the root cause of it. Uh, and I think that's something that, uh, especially with um, online interactions in a sort of porous public face, we're seeing much less to hide behind from the point of view of, of telecom providers. Up here in Canada, we have a service provider called Rogers that used to um, spend a lot of uh, time convincing people they should use their onerously priced telecom packages. And... Canadians have fled in droves to using little MiFi devices, and now Rogers has an offering they're trying to sell to the market. No one wants it because they've all found other solutions. And they could have, and that's probably millions of dollars in revenue they could have avoided by finding these leading indicators of someone, hey, look, they're roaming in the U.S., but they're not buying the data from us. Let's call them and find out why. Um, and so there's all these leading indicators, and if anything, service providers have more data than any other industry because they are the only ones that have this frequent recurring contact with their customers, and especially in the cases of telecom, banks, they see every interaction with their customer. So they're awash in a sea of data, and yet they're the worst to act on. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this other question here, Alistair, that we had, because I think it, it, it's, a, it's a good one and uh, flows well. So uh, somebody asked, can metrics identify a pivot or only uh, that your current product or service isn't working? So... Um, so I think, yes, absolutely, metrics can identify a pivot. And in the book, I'll, I'll use one of the concepts we have in the book called the Lean Analytic Cycle. And the Lean Analytic Cycle is essentially build, measure, learn, but with more detail. That's the way I like to describe it. And so um, 
you know, for, let, I'll use a, a, an example. I'll use churn as an example, sort of following on what Alistair had said earlier. But let's say I realize that churn, which is, you know, the number of typically paid customers, but it could be users in a, in a consumer business, but uh, the number of paid users that are abandoning my service or my product. Um, and let's say I want to improve churn. So I'm going to run a number of experiments to improve churn. And let's say my churn is 10% a month. I'm sort of picking numbers randomly. I have a line in the sand. Let's say I want to hit 5% a month. Um, and so uh, I start running these experiments and I'm measuring the results and I get from 10%, let's say, to 8%. So not really good enough. But in one particular segment of my customer base, um, I, I was able to, um, you know, massively improve churn or get to 5%, let's say. So, you know, I, my average was 8%, um, whole numbers of segments of my business, customer segments, I wasn't able to move the needle, but one segment I was able to move the needle. Um, that is the indicator for the potential of a pivot, right? It's the, it's the lesson of, wait a second, there's a bunch of customers here, a segment of customers, a group within all of my users or all of my customers that where my product or what I've been doing seems to really resonate. Um, and maybe what I need to do in, in this particular example is verticalize and focus on that. And so the idea of the lean analytic cycle is you're going through these experiments, you're measuring things, you're tracking the results, and that's going to either tell you you've succeeded and what next you should track, what problem you should solve next, or give you indicators into directions that you're able to go to, which could lead into pivoting. Yeah, and I think um, there was another question sort of in this thing about uh, identifying pivoting versus um, optimizing current stuff. We have to understand that there's this concept in statistics or mathematics of a local maxima. And so if you're standing on the side of a hill, um, the hill that's up above you is your local maxima. But there may be a hill somewhere nearby that's taller. To get to it, you have to go downhill and then back up. And so the moving from a local maxima to a global maxima is a constant problem because uh, Blockbuster may have been op trying to optimize the local maxima of video store rentals, but they probably weren't optimizing the global maxima of uh, entertainment delivery. And so you frame this sort of landscape um, and then based on that framing, you try to optimize what you think is local to you. In many cases, innovation is actually about moving from a local maximum to a more global maximum by redefining your business. And the challenge politically is that to get to that other uh, global maximum, you often have to go downhill in, in using my analogy. So uh, there's a newspaper here in Montreal called La Presse that wants to get rid of all its print newspapers and become entirely digital. And that's a pretty bold move for them. Because they're currently hypothesizing that that global maxima of digital only is a better business. It's very hard for them to walk downhill from printing the paper um, on paper where they have existing customers. So in many cases, you're by favoring your legacy customers, who are the ones you got here, here in the got you here in the first place, you tend to optimize for metrics that make them happy, and therefore you tend to optimize for local maxima. And we say in the book that um, that optimization is for algorithms and machines and that innovation is for humans. So humans tend to be good at finding those those global maxima and, and brainstorming, and that's really where minimum viable products and sort of adjacencies come about. Uh, one of the guys I talked to, Bill Rue, who runs analytics for GE, uh, I didn't realize this, but you know that GE swooshy symbol, the sort of circle with the three droplets in it? So there's a reason for that symbol, which is that GE started out making light bulbs and light, and then they made uh, electrical delivery systems. Well, it turns out you need generators for that. And then when you um, have generation, you may as well turn the motor around, and then you have an engine, electrical engine, which is the engine they put in motors. And then, well, now that you're making engines, you may as well make plane engines because they spin too. And then it turns out that MRIs rotate at high speed, and the vibrations and making precise rotational things is really important for radiology, so they got into MRIs. So everything was an adjacency, right? Hey, we're really good at making things spin fast without going off the rails. Let's make an MRI. And GE has this really good look. at They, they constantly say to themselves, What's the, what's the adjacent thing? How can we use this in some other way? What else could we disrupt with this? Uh, and that's why their logo is this spinny thing with the three droplets. I had no idea. But every innovation they made is sort of spending a lot of time asking how else something can be applied or what other problem it could solve. So I'm going to keep going through some of the questions here. Um, so we had a question which I think if, you, if you're looking at the chat, we're having a quick discussion there about what core analysis is. But um, somebody asks here, um, and I think this is sort of relevant uh, for us in, at a broader scale. So, um, you know, with cohort analysis, it will tell us when something is happening. 
but what, uh, you know, what can we do about why it's happening? And so in the book, and I think this is, this is um, very, very important to understand, um, and this is the point of me talking about things like simplifying of data, it's that you're using, um, we, we talk about qualitative data and quantitative data. And so qualitative data is really customer feedback. Um, it's, so never throughout the process of running your business or through a lean startup or at any stage of your company from the very beginning to the very end when it's a giant successful company, uh, should you ever stop talking to customers to collect qualitative information. But you're going to use quantitative data to verify whether the qualitative feedback that you're getting from customers is actually true. And so, so Hannah FUTM here is a absolutely right that, you know, when we look at the data, it gives us, it tells us what's happening, but doesn't necessarily tell us why things are happening. And the why comes from talking to customers and really understanding and trying to um, uh, combine the qualitative data and feedback we collect from customers with quantitative measurement. Um, yeah, so, so let me talk a little about proxies there because this is a really big problem. Uh, when I want to know about conversions on a website, I can go count conversions. When I want to know whether someone's doing a thing I want in another world, it's harder without technology to track those outcomes. So I'll give you an example. In Haiti, um, there was a, uh, a technology used. They were trying to, trying to understand uh, the outbreak of cholera. And <clears throat> the, um, the proxy they used for this was if, the, um, if a user uh, or a, a user of a mobile phone frequently moves across three or four towers each day on their way to work and back, and all of a sudden that person stops moving across those towers, they didn't travel for some reason. And if a large number of people who live in the same area suddenly stop traveling, that's probably an outbreak of cholera. We should go look, right? And so uh, at one point there was some flooding there, and uh, flooding, because it raises the water table, is often correlated with an outbreak of cholera. And so as a result, they said, okay, well, we have the flooding, and then there's this village here. And it looks like nobody's moving. We should probably send in the Red Cross. Turns out some field researcher on the, gra researcher on the ground said, you know what? Um, the bridge is washed out. So it's a really good example of like, you, you had this proxy you thought was useful, but don't ever stop with the qualitative data. We see this over and over again. Boston has an app called Street Pump, uh, where people turn on their smartphone and it measures when their car bumps and the city can use that to track potholes. Of course, what it does is it shows you where all the rich people with smartphones and unlimited data plans live. And so they have to temper that information because it's much less useful um, in certain neighborhoods. And then one last example, Nicole Nedich from Oakland told me um, that if you know anything about Oakland, uh, apparently the uh, Oakland Hills, which is the rich part of town, has a much higher crime rate than the flats, which is not the rich part of town. Because if one person leaves a mattress out on a street uh, in the middle of the day in the hills, they get like 10 calls about it. So they can't use the number of uh, inbound crime complaints as a way of deciding where to do policing. So all of these things are attempts to find a proxy for the real thing, the location of potholes, outbreaks of cholera, uh, and, and without qualitative information, knowing that people don't report crimes in the Oakland Flats or that rich people have smartphones uh, and, and unlimited data plans, you wind up getting stuck on these bad proxies. And I think that's a, that's a real challenge. Um, so uh, when you're trying to do this stuff, this is back to the, the friction we talked about in, in measuring when you're a non-tech company is that you got to be very careful that you're not actually watching something that's misleading. You always, if anything, you have to do more and more qualitative stuff than you do in a tech firm. Yeah, absolutely. We, we got a good question here, uh, Alistair, and maybe you want to tackle this one, basically about drawing lines in the sand. And, and so I'm, you mentioned it, I mentioned it, I think, you know, the importance of you can't just pick a metric. You, you know, you have a problem, you pick a metric that you think is going to help you understand whether you're solving or not solving that problem. And then we're also asking you to draw a line in the sand. And, and we cover this in the lean analytics cycle as well, which is you need a benchmark, you need a goal, because how do you know if you've succeeded or not? So the question, of course, which is, which is fairly clear, is sort of how do you find that line? If you don't have data or you haven't been tracking it, you know, how do you come up with a line in the sand? Yeah, so uh, it's a, if you've got a year, in your, a year of your time, feel free to do what we did and ask everyone you know. Uh, and I gave you the hard the question. Do you see that? Right. See how I didn't answer Thanks. that? <laughs> uh, so well, we actually spent, take it. Yeah, we spent a lot of our time doing this. Uh, the reality is uh, put a stake in the ground. I don't care if it's stupid. It'll move as soon as you start measuring things. A lot of founders I talk to and they're like, well, we have this business model. I'm like, okay, those are your numbers. Where'd you get them from? Well, they made them up. Okay, well, let's try something and see if, oh, look, it turns out your conversion rate is 2%, not 30%. Now let's put it 
let's meet halfway and go 15%, try again. And so what you typically want to do is the first step is you evaluate all of the stages that you need a customer to go through to help your business. Then you assign what you think is your assumptions about those stages. Then you try it and you measure what actually happened. You look at the gulf between what's out there. Now, when you're talking about the um, difference between what might be and what is, um, there is a ton of uh, data out there about um, what numbers might work. So, for example, churn in a software as a service company should be below 5% before you move ahead and below 2% a month before you really step on the gas. We just know that from talking to lots of people. But you may have a different business where that's okay, where um, you know, you're, you're focused on a very short amount of time. So definitely go get that data. I think I see a lot of people using Lean Startup um, as an excuse to move recklessly, and there's no excuse for not being deliberate. Lean does not mean little amounts of money. Lean does not mean super, super fast. It's like Einstein said, right? As simple as possible, but no simpler. There's a reason it's called the minimum viable product, not just the minimum product. I've seen a lot of people who do a test with the minimum product. It wasn't viable, and they wasted an entire testing cycle. So you got to understand what is viable. That's a part of getting inside your customer's head and making your best guess. And if this stuff was spelled out, uh, the challenge of using existing data is that you wind up creating an existing business. And so um, when Netflix, for example, started out, they said, well, we think people want in-home delivery. We have all these, uh, these assumptions about something five years down the road, but there isn't enough domestic broadband yet, so we're going to start shipping out um, DVDs to people in envelopes. Clearly, they had a bunch of assumptions about how to work with um, DVDs and business uh, versus um, the long-term goal of how people watch, how people would consume content. So I'm not sure if I answered that question entirely, but, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's and I'm noticing on the chat here, we're saying, uh, is there a bridge between cohort analysis and academic knowledge? Frankly, the best founders I know are just consuming everything they can on a subject. Um, and, and, you know, it isn't really a tech example, but um, we talked in, in the book about an example of this group called Circle of Friends. It was an app on Facebook for making people into groups, and this is a tech example. And uh, they had all, uh, millions of users, but very little engagement. And so before giving up, they went and looked at which groups were heavily engaged. It turns out the people who were heavily engaged, who were using the tool and inviting others and so on, were all moms. And they actually changed the name of the company to Circle of Moms and were then very happy. So one thing is data to optimize your business. And that's where you're sort of, you know, can I make the button pink instead of green? Or if you're a uh, restaurant, should, which menu should I try? And that's where you're doing optimization. The other is sort of innovation, where you're saying, is there a group here? Maybe it turns out that there's a lot of people coming up to your counter and saying, can I get takeout? And you're saying no to them all. Well, if you knew that, maybe you should have a takeout counter. But you're not going to innovate in that way if you aren't doing customer development or tracking you know, why people left and so on. We've got a question on um, Twitter here, a uh, practical one. Sort of, what do you think of Google Analytics, and do you have a preferred analytical program? So I'll, you know, I'll just say very quickly that I think when you're starting, you know, um, we're, I'm largely tool agnostic. Um, it's sort of use the best tool for the, for the job. Of course, figuring out what that is might take some time, but I like to think, I, you know, what I recommend particularly to early stage companies, before you really know what questions you're going to even ask of your data, A, collect a whole bunch of stuff, but focus on specific things. Um, Google Analytics is fine for that. There are lots of other tools out there, depending on what you're trying to do. I think over time, as you learn more about your business and you learn about what questions you want to ask the data, you may be stringing things together. You may be building custom queries of your database. Uh, you may be building custom analytical software, bits and pieces of things that you need. Um, but by and large, start with the basic tools, learn from those as quickly as you can, and then figure out over time, what business am I really in? What really does matter? What do I need to really look at inside of this data? And that's going to help you pick better tools. But I mean, there's, there's a host of them. Uh, Google Analytics is sort of the basis. Just throw these things in there. Kiss metrics for funnel measurement. Um, Keen.io, we've gotten some great feedback from people. These are not particularly endorsements. I'm, I don't want to say that these are specific endorsements, but Keen.io for mobile. Um, we've recommended that a few times, gotten great feedback from people. So, it, you know, there's lots of little yeah, tools the, out there. You know, the reality is that there, you use Excel for numbers. It's not the best tool for every job, but it, Google Analytics is kind of like the Excel of analytics, That's right? right? Yep. 
it's the general tool. And then you throw in these other more specific stuff. Um, we've done a lot of work with Gecko Board. Uh, there's a big U three hour Udemy presentation that they helped record. Uh, and those guys aren't really an analytics tool as much as they are a display tool. But oftentimes you're tracking something specific to your product or service. You just need to, be able to throw that out as a feed through a simple API to some kind of dashboard. So in many cases, you're counting stuff yourself, right? Yeah. So I, I, what I would recommend, and I see companies um, making this mistake, they get really caught up in what they're tracking and, and how they're tracking it. And I would just say start tracking stuff and, and, and move. And don't get caught up in building custom analytics tools because you think you're smarter than what already exists out there. Um, I've used a bunch of stuff, like I use Optimizely for A-B testing web pages, right? That's perfectly fine. It dumps data into Google Analytics and you, you're off to the races. Uh, I, I did want to mention one quick thing, um, which I think is really interesting, is we talked to DHL, and DHL actually does a lot of innovation. Um, and one of the things they told us is they don't think about creating new products as creating new products. And this is a really good lesson from a political point of view. If you're in a bigger organization, um, don't tell your boss, I'm going to go create a new company. Tell your boss, I am going to conduct a research study. That way, there's a 100% chance of success. If you try something out and it fails, you've learned a lot and it's going to be a great study. If you try something out and it succeeds, you've learned a lot, it's a great study, and you've created a business. And so DHL told me they were looking at uh, 3D printing. And of course, lots of people say, oh, you're in logistics, you're doing shipping, 3D printing is going to kill you. And they said, well, hey, why don't we try and start a business in that space? And it turns out, after a bunch of time, that that's not a good place to be. But now they have a very uh, significant credibility with their customers because they've written reports on this. And when some competitor says, as we're doing 3D printing, they've got a list of reasons why that wouldn't work. So for them, and they're very open innovation, um, they don't think about every new product as a new product as much as they do as a way to learn. Because in the old days, to write a study, you would have to go, I mean, can you imagine what it was like pre-internet to go and find out who your competitors were and what they were up to? You just think about what that was like. It was like anecdotes that came back from the sales force once a year at sales training. That was the best you could do. Or you'd go pay some company like Thompson Reuters or someone or, you know, one of these companies that looked at, like, corporate listings. But it was really hard to know your competition. Today, the cost of researching something is vanishingly small. So the cost of starting a prototype with clouds and social media and so on is almost as cheap as it used to be to research something properly. So say to your boss, hey, you know, I'm doing a study. How you doing? Can I get approval for the study? Sure. How are you going to run the study? Well, I'm going to go build something. And that's often just as easy as it was, as it is to write a report, you may accidentally launch a product. So it's it's this culture of experimentation and framing um, innovation as studying a market. The, as Ben often says, the goal is to learn, and then once you've got enough learning, the product will become obvious. Yeah, and and I think it, it you know I the example I think about is when I was speaking with someone at Comcast, and they were talking about you know how did you get lean into the company, and and the answer to that was we just started. Um, and so it was really sort of, you know, people came to us with a project, and I think this ties nicely with the question earlier about service providers. Um, you know, if you're a service provider, let's say you're, you're you know, um, somebody comes to you with a project, you want to do the project, you have to budget the project, and step one, instead of saying, well, let's plan this whole thing out and build the whole thing, and, and you know, before we realize if anybody wants it or not, you know, step one is, let's go talk to customers. And it wasn't... Um, it wasn't making a big deal out of it. It wasn't saying we have to change everything in our company. It wasn't saying we're applying, you know, oh, what, look what these cool startups are doing, so we're going to apply that into our business. It wasn't anything along those lines. It was just similar to what Alistair is saying. It's like, oh, well, we can't fail if we just talk to customers. Let's just see what happens. Um, and it's so, and then everybody just said, oh, I guess that's the process we're applying in this project. Um, and they were, uh, and they were set to go. So I think it's, you can, I'll say you can sneak lean startup or sneak lean analytics or the combination of both into companies by just starting as simply as possible. Yeah, and I think uh, I'll give you two examples, one very big, one very small. I have a coffee shop down my street that has tip jars out, and they, have, uh, they put out a question, and they look at which one got the most tips. It's great for their tips, and then they, ask, they can ask people, like, which of these two products would you like us to serve? That's a survey, right? And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got Walmart. And Walmart has this, uh, this campaign called Get on the Shelf, where people nominate products, and then Walmart has votes and tests them. It's basically like Kickstarter for shelf space at Walmart. And, you know, there's a project at MIT called Ruminate, started by two uh, 
engineers who decided that uh, girls needed better than dollhouses. So it's like a, an architectural dollhouse. You can build yourself with motors. It's awesome. And uh, they're in the middle of this Get on the Shelf campaign. It means that everybody's drumming up support for this stuff. Both of those are forms of experimentation. Both of those are a recognition. You know, the, the once upon a time in the 50s, the average lifespan of a company on the Standard & Poor 500 was 58 years, I think. Uh, 2013, it's down to about 13 years. So you are no longer guaranteed. People say startups have nothing to lose, but big companies have everything to lose. And so I think there's a recognition that they need to start disrupting more, running more experiments, taking more risks, uh, focusing on learning, framing uh, new products as a way of finding things out, uh, chasing the data instead of just accepting it. And all of this is why I say that um, non-tech companies are still tech companies. And everybody we talk to is trying to apply these lean methodologies of faster cycle time and more informed learnings. All right, so it's probably a lot. It's around 1 o'clock. We should shut up now. Yeah, I think that's fair. Do we have any other last-minute questions that anybody wants to, to throw out there for us? Um, and I will point out that um, I think we shared our Twitter handle. So if you have questions later on, by all means, just follow up with myself or Alistair or both of us, and, and we're happy to engage you there as well. Right, and we did mention, uh, so Ben and I were in the UK. A gecko board uh, asked us to come over there and talk about this stuff. And we did do a three-hour-long uh, presentation on Udemy. Uh, if you want to sign up for it, it's free. It's us talking like this for three hours with lots more slides. Uh, we also have a ton of stuff uh, on SlideShare. If you guys are uh, curious, I'll put that in the link here. Hang on a second. Uh, we have a ton of slides that we put on the analysis. Uh, ben and I both have day jobs, uh, Ben more than me, but uh, we don't we don't spend a lot of time sort of charging for the stuff we put out there. Um, so most of our content's out there. Uh, obviously, if you like the book, um, we'd love it if you bought a copy, and please tell us what you think about it. And, um, and uh, Alistair, if you're coming to, just shared those. Oh, sorry, Alistair, go ahead. And if you're coming to DC, if you're coming to San Francisco in December, uh, obviously to the Lean Startup Workshop, uh, we'd love to have you join us for the uh, Lean Analytics for Intrapreneurs Workshop. Room. Yeah, and we did get one. If we have time for one last question, I saw there. How can I mix qualitative and quantitative when I have very few customers, like less than five? So yes, there's always we, and actually, this is a really there's a broader point here. We often, I often get the sort of feedback, you know, how much data do I actually need before it's statistically relevant and this sort of thing. And again, I, I tend not to worry too too much about that because I guarantee you, if you start just focusing on this stuff and simplifying the kinds of questions you're asking of your data, you will get relevant answers. I would say with, with five or less customers, you're going to spend much more, I would engage them as much as you can. And really, at that stage, you're probably at the empathy stage of your business, which is really primarily about qualitative feedback. Are you solving a problem for these people that legitimately matters enough? And then that follows with, are they using your product uh, enough, frequently enough, whatever engagement or stickiness means to you before you start focusing on additional customers. But five customers is great because you can call all of them. That's not, it's early and I'm sure you want more customers, but it's not a bad stage to be at from a qualitative perspective. Uh, yeah, and I did just notice when I paste these links into um, the Ustream thing, I noticed that the colon in the HTTPS colon doesn't work. I don't know if that's Ustream blocking Udemy by removing a colon. Um, even though it appears in the text and you click on it, the colon is mysteriously removed. I just tried it twice. So you have to manually select the text that's there and then paste it in a browser for some reason. It's not doing it for SlideShare, but for some reason Ustream is stripping out the colon after the HTTPS uh, for the Udemy link. Maybe that's uh, Lean Learnings in, a in action right there. Uh, yeah, I think qualitative quantitative, that's a really big challenge. And, and and it's it's just curiosity, right? I wish I could teach curiosity because all the other stuff seems to come out of that. Like, why did I get a purple pen? Um, you know, that, that seemed to work. But most people don't ask that question. They don't think curiously like that. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time, and we'll let, um, we'll let them wrap up here. All right. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Alistair. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. This wraps up our show. Please join us again for the next webcast, Lean Impact, Implementing Lean in Mission-Driven Organizations on November 5th. In the meantime, visit leanstartup.co for more information on the Lean Startup Conference held on December 9 to 11 in San Francisco. Bye, everyone.